Welcome in. Hail to the podcast brought to you by Maze and Blue Review. A normally very exciting selection Sunday. Kind of boring for Michigan fans today. Unfortunately, obviously they were not involved in the selection show this week, but the NC the NCAA tournament field is set. Uh, basketball, on the other hand, has moved on from Juwan Howard. We will get into the coaching search and where that stands today. Some candidate names we're hearing, candidates we like, some we don't like, etc. We'll talk about that a little bit. Michigan football spring practice begins this week. I can't believe it. <laughs> football is a year-round sport, but yeah, spring practice, Team 145 kick it off. We'll get into some of the storylines, players to watch. Uh, feel free to ask questions in that segment as well if you're joining us live in the comment section. And then we'll move on to Michigan hockey. It's a busy time for Michigan sports. Uh, uh, they beat Minnesota again. They've had their number the last few years. Go to the Big Ten Championship final against Michigan State. How beautiful is that? The first <laughs> Martins. Uh, looks like they've got their NCAA tournament bid locked up. We'll talk about that a little bit as well. So yeah, football, basketball, hockey, going to be an eventful show. We have Mr. Brock Heilig, the perfect man for this type of show because he covers it all in his hostage closet for this week's <laughs> one of the locations he joins us live from. But how you doing, brother? I'm doing good. Yeah, I got I got banished to the closet today. I have some people over. Uh, we were watching the selection show. And, and like you mentioned, no Michigan, but it's still a good time, you know, yeah. Michigan, Michigan or not, it's, it's good. March Madness is, is, is fun. No matter what really. Um, I was watching a little bit of Brown versus Yale earlier in the I, Ivy league championship and Yale had the, had the buzzer beater. It, it's, it's awesome. I, I love March. It's, it's March Madness is, is just the best. So I'm it's looking forward to the tournament that, that first region, I can't, I think it was the East region with UConn. Yes. Illinois, Ridiculous. Iowa State, that's that's a loaded region, so I'm excited to see how that's going to shake I, out. Yeah, four of the top ten Ken Palm teams, three of the top five in the same region, with the number one overall seed, UConn. Big East only got three seeds in. Michigan State getting a nine was very surprising to me. Yeah. I thought yep. for sure they'd be in the play in. so when I saw Virginia – was in that last 10 10 game. I'm like, oh my God, Michigan State might actually get left out. No, the brand, I don't ever want to hear about brand bias with Michigan football ever again because I don't <laughs> think Michigan State basketball and Tom Izzo just got in because of that being Michigan State and Tom Izzo. Like, oh my God. Yeah. When he talked about how they're up till two o'clock in the morning and all this stuff and making all these changes, it's like, okay, this is why we get these messed up brackets. You guys are overthinking this like that's what were you up till two o'clock in the morning for that's crazy but anyway yeah it's gonna be fun excited to fill out brackets i will spend hours and hours <laughs> and looking at numbers and doing weird things to pick my bracket my wife will win because she picks the animals and colors that she likes <laughs> and my six-year-old who's super into logos is like excited to pick this year so i'm gonna laugh when they both beat me after i put yep. hours and hours of work into my bracket but that's how it works since we're on basketball, let, let's start with basketball, get this out of the way first, then we'll move into football, the, the spring kickoff. Um, obviously, Juwan Howard, no longer the head coach for Michigan basketball. He issued a statement today. Um, I kind of want to get Brock's thoughts on it. We talked about it a little bit. But he, here's where we sit with the coaching search today. Uh, Turnkey, the third-party company that helps with consulting and hiring, things like this, you've heard their name before, I'm sure. They have been hired to assist with the coaching search. As of today, we don't have any feedback on a timeline of any sort. Uh, so this doesn't feel like something that's going to be rushed. Uh, there's been talk of, I hate the phrase, the home run hire, right? Does Michigan need to yep. make a home run hire? And uh, again, I don't know what home run hire means. I think it just, I think that's just name recognition, frankly, but that's a different thing. Players can and are entering the portal. We'll get Brock's thoughts on that. We have one in already and I, think we can expect more <laughs> um but yeah let, let's start with that i guess with, with the players jumping in brock uh george washington the third did leave the door open for a possible return to michigan but he enters and it feels like the first of many it does and you know we mentioned on, on the podcast on friday when this juan howard news broke that this it's going to be a complete overhaul in terms of the roster from from this year to next year and I tell you what, I wouldn't have bet that George Washington III was going to be the first Fair. to enter the portal, but he, here we are. He, he was. And uh, 
I think a lot of what he'll factor into his decision will be who, obviously who the coach is and probably what happens with guys like Doug McDaniel and Christian Anderson and Darrell Brooks. And so obviously we'll have to see what happens there, but yeah, a lot that's going to have to factor in for, for not only, not only George Washington, the third, but all of these guys, I mean, they're all going to have to figure out who the coach is going to be next year. They're all going to have to see what the roster looks like. I mean, we saw it a few days ago when, when Connie Ruth said he's got to wait and see who the coach is and who he's going to be playing with before he makes a decision about, about what he does next year. So yeah, and he still hasn't signed. So yeah. yeah. So, and, and that's coming up soon in, in April. So we're going to have to see, you know, like, like the players have said, who's, who's going to be the coach first of all, and then who's going to be on the roster, who they're going to be playing with. It, it's going to have to move. It's going to have to move fast because you want these guys to make decisions and get, get guys committed for next year, but it can't move too fast and, and, and feel rushed if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, you, you take the time to make the right hire, right? I mean, you'd like to think or assume, and I mean, we'll get to some of the candidate names in a moment here, but some of these candidates should be in the tournament right now. So that already kind of builds in a natural <laughs> timeline, right? Like you're going to have to yep. wait for some of these guys to finish their season that that's going to be part of it um, with, with the roster though, like you said, it, it's going to be a complete overhaul. And I don't know that there's anybody you're really in panic mode about if they go or don't go. And I, and I don't mean that in like a terrible way or anything, but it's just, this is what happens when you go eight and 24 and you have to see a complete you know, turnover. So Doug Reed cheddar, that class could, I wouldn't be shocked if all of them enter, right? Like, yeah. it, again, I don't want to get too much weird with the speculation, but that that's just kind of what we're looking at here. And then, yeah, from the guys coming in, uh, Brooks issued a comment as well saying, Hey, I, I got to see who the coach is. Right. Mm -hmm. So that that's really, I think you're going to see some current roster players are going to move on no matter what. And then there's obviously a group of folks that are going to be in the, Hey, you know, what, where, who's coming in and I'll go from there. And then, yeah, whoever's coming in, whew, Already, already two empty chairs trying to seal up the class, like you said, with Bruce not even signed in yet, and then trying to keep who you have, and then going to the portal and adding four, five, six, seven, eight who knows how many guys yeah. they have to do. So, uh, Juwan did issue a statement today. I do feel I think there was some feelings that this could be a tense thing. Uh, both he and his wife issued, I, I felt classy statements, but I did want to get your thoughts because there was. A part of me that was like, um, <laughs> I mean, you have the, you have the right to say this, right? But you know, he, he comes out with the generic. I think the University Board of Regents Ward, you know, um, but the second paragraph during my tenure as head coach, we shared memorable seasons and achievements, including a Big Ten championship, back-to-back -back Sweet Sixteen appearances, being one game from the Final Four. I was honored to be named the AP Coach of the Year, Big Ten Coach of the Year. That kind of felt like, hey. <laughs> Just remember who you're getting rid of here, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, and I, I would, I would just say that it, it did. It kind of looked like here's everything that I accomplished in, in my five years, and, um, and like, and like you said, here's who you're getting rid of. I, I just, I kind of thought it was a little weird, and we, we talked about that a little bit earlier off, off the air, but just an odd way for a legend or an icon of, of Michigan basketball to kind of write to kind of lead in with that in in this in this awkward divorce was a little little strange yeah like I said I mean I get it but I don't know it, it touched me where my devotion he goes on my devotion and dedication to this program and most importantly to my players and their families provided a challenge that I welcomed embrace which required me to grow and expand my capabilities both personally and professionally. Um, I, I believe that like the players love Juwan. That's never been a thing anyone has ever suggested. Isn't true. It's, it's a matter of, was he putting, you know, Josh has made a lot of good points about the NBA atmosphere and how that hasn't worked with college kids and him putting them in the right position. And then, I don't know. I read that. And I immediately thought of the Sanderson situation and it's just like kind of awkward. <laughs> and then yep. he did bring up the health challenges, which there were some rumors that maybe he would resign under that guys. He says, my health challenges during this past season tested my resolve, but true to the form of a Michigan man, I stood and faced them with the support of my family, players, and staff. Um, two things. One, the, the heart surgery he had is very serious. 
right and and yep. him going through that process and and what that required i agree that had to be a scary scary thing and it, it's impressive what he was able to do that said <laughs> i've brought this up before the way he came back to the team where we're getting different information about how long he's going to be gone when he'll be back and then he's showing up sitting as a fan but like coaching and then having to be an assistant coach and whatever i <sighs> I just wish that that would have been, I don't know if he needed to take more time away or, or how that had to be handled differently for me to feel better about it. Because if he needed to take more time, everybody would have supported that. Yep. Right. So that really was the turn of the season when he came back, just the vibe of that entire thing when he first returned. Yeah. And, and like you said, if he, if he decided to, you know, step away until, the new year, even even the start of 2024, that would have fan, – fans wouldn't have cared. And and Phil Martelli would have done a good enough job to where he could have ho- held the floor down until Juwan came back. And, you know, that probably didn't affect the outcome of the season. The team simply just wasn't going to win games this year based right. on how it was constructed and, and coaching and things like that. But I don't know. And and, and for him, him to bring that up, it's – he kind of frames it in the way of an excuse, but he doesn't really say, "Yeah, like this is why we lost." He 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 brings it up as like a reminder of, "Yeah, this this happened, and you know I persevered." You you can just kind of tell he was kind of blaming the health issues, and, and like you said, Trevor, there were some rumors out there that that Ward and and Juwan were potentially going to just part ways due to the health issues and, and use that as the, the biggest factor, but no, he was fired. And then here comes Juwan with a statement saying, Oh, you know, I just, I dealt with health issues throughout the whole season and, and kind of citing that as a reason why the team wasn't very good. It, it, it's, it's a little off. Yeah. And to your point with the ward situation, the, the, the reports were, and, and what Josh reported over at Michigan.rivals.com for us was Ward went into this meeting open-minded, right? I, I think he knew what was true in terms of what did not go well, what needed to change, but he wanted to hear what Juwan had to say, some accountability. And of course, the most important thing, the plan for the future, right? How do we fix this? What's next? What do you need to do? What do I need to do, right? How can we, if we're going to do another year, what do we need to do? How can we do it? Yep. Right. Because that was the whole thing. Everybody makes the Harbaugh comparisons to 2020. And I, I think that's the key piece is you have to be able to say, look, what can we do? Because sometimes a change happens with a coach and a program that respect each other and have had a lot of success together. But there's just not a clear path forward, whether that's fair or not. Yep. And by all accounts, Juwan came in and basically like you said, sounds like made some excuses and whether it was about NIL or, you know, this, it, 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 there was clearly not a path forward. Right. And, and that's just where this ends. And I, the part I did appreciate at the end here, Michigan will always be a significant part of my legacy and I will be a significant part of theirs. I don't mind him saying that because it's true. And, and I do think time will heal wounds (laughs) if you will. And I am willing to think that his health and being gone throughout the preseason and every, any, all of that could have played a factor. Right. And then I I believe that I just don't know how you bounce back from eight and 24 and where they were. And I think a change is again, fair or not a change had to be made. I wouldn't be surprised if he goes to a lower college gig or goes to the NBA and does well. And then again, a few years from now, I hope there's no, I already saw, I don't know about you, but I, I already saw kind of a, um, I don't know what term I want to use, but like uh, there was a movement among the fan base today where it was like, I think everybody's just been screaming for Juwan to be fired. And now that it's actually happened, there's kind of this malaise and sadness about the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. We'll we'll see what happens. I don't know. I I figure he'll go to the NBA. I just, I, I just don't think he's built for the college game and I think he'd be much more much more successful in the NBA. We'll have to wait and see what happens. But yeah, overall, although it was a little strange, I do think it it was a classy message by Juwan. He he still loves Michigan with all of his heart, right. and 
he's an icon and, and Michigan loves him. It just, it never worked out as a coach for him. And it's unfortunate that's the way it has to end, but, but it does. So Michigan moves on, Juwan moves on. They both still have respect for each other, both still love each other, but it just, it didn't work out. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's that simple. And, and you can do the what ifs, man, if livers isn't hurt in that tournament run, right? Like yeah. it, I always said that before Jim obviously went on this three year run, if JT wasn't ruled short, right. If, if McCorn doesn't throw the interception, like there's these moments where it completely changes perspective. So um, this, this was just where it was a change needed to happen. And I'm, I'm glad it's not as ugly as maybe some people thought it would be right. So Oliver asks, and that's what we're going to get to who are potential replacements. Now I'm going to show you some names knowing full well, a lot of names are being thrown out right now, right? I think there's some obvious favorites, if you will, or, or moves that make sense. There's probably some names that people would love that aren't realistic. It, it, it's a long list right now. Michigan is arguably the first or second best job open right now. You've got Louisville as well, Ohio State electing to keep their interim head coach, which I think was Diebler, right? Yeah, Jake Diebler. I almost said Keebler, and I'm like, I know that's not right. <laughs> uh, it's kind of a no-brainer. They didn't really have a choice after the run he went on after being named the interim. So, yeah, but kind of like that, the Earl Moore situation a little bit. Very similar. Yeah, he's been around the program for a while. Comes in. I mean, obviously Jim was still around, right? But to, to replace the coach in that situation, and yeah, it, it, it's just a move that makes sense for them. But Ohio State probably had a lot of the same similar names listed as candidates. So maybe that eliminates a spot for them, right? I'm seeing John Beeline listed a lot. So we might as well get that out of the way. We've heard everything from he may be interested if it is offered to him. Maybe he's willing to do like a one-year transition thing. He will likely have some sort of role in the process I know you talked about this last week or even a few days ago when we did the breaking news on Jawad Howard, but w where are you with Beeline and are, does the one year transition thing intrigue you at all or three years or whatever it would be, I guess. It intrigues me, but I still don't think it would be a good idea. I, I talked about this a little bit. I think it was Friday. It was either Thursday or Friday when the news broke about Juwan, but John Beeline is 71 years old and I said this the other day, in order for John Beeline to come back to Michigan, John Beeline's got to want to come back to Michigan, and I'm not convinced that's the case. I I don't personally personally know John Beeline. I don't talk to him or anything like that. I just don't think at this point in his, in his career he's interested in returning to Michigan. And I think he's happy with retirement, happy with what he's doing with the Big Ten Network. So... In my, if I was Ward Manuel, I wouldn't go that route. The, the the one year thing, I've seen that thrown around on online on social media. It it might work, I don't know, but bringing in Beeline to just coach a team full of transfers for one year and then bringing in another guy the next year just doesn't seem like the best path that the program can take if that makes any sense like like John Beeline is a master at developing guys recruit recruiting guys developing them and, and building a team and I just don't think if Beeline comes in for one year he's going to be very successful just picking and choosing guys from the transfer portal and, and putting them on the court and, and saying go play basketball I, I just don't think that's his style I don't think it would work well for Michigan I think they'd be much better off going with probably any of the guys listed here and hoping that they can be your coach long-term rather than, than using beeline for just a year or two or three. I, I think you nailed it. What, what beeline strength is would be the long-term build, right? Michigan yeah. didn't turn around instantly when he got here. Right. So, so the one year thing doesn't make a ton of sense to me, especially when we're talking about, NIL transfer portal obstacles when we've been saying this whole time that Beeline probably would have struggled in this era anyway. I hope he's around the program in some role. Um, that's why I've got one name buried on here. I, I do not think he's going to be the hire by any means, but I know it's somebody that Ward 
thinks highly of and would like to potentially be a part of the process. And that's DeAndre Haynes, who is assistant for Beeline. He's at Marquette right now. The, the fan base would revolt <laughs> if an assistant with no head coaching experience was hired right now. Yeah. But, you know, you, in a different world, you could you could sell Haynes, right? But mm-hmm. if uh, that's why I saw somebody say, hey, Yaklich is without a job too. Maybe JB comes back with Haynes and Yaklich for a year, and then Haynes takes over after a year. I'm like, that's just not real world. No. I, that's just not something I've ever seen a program do, and it would be a really bizarre situation. So – I don't think it's realistic right now, but we're at the beginning. So Michigan might need to get some no's or, you know, maybe this goes in a different way where it becomes more realistic. But right now I think that the top four names I have listed seem to be the most popular ones. Iowa State's TJ Otzelberger has obviously become a very, very popular name considering a lot of people thought they might be up for a one seed. They end up being the last two seed, which was kind of surprising, but yeah. the way they play basketball which is ferocious, all effort, right? Team, team, very, I mean, his offenses in previous spots have been very, very lean. He went to Iowa State, has been nothing but defense, best defense. Um, The the way he talks to it, it's a very, it makes me think of a Michigan football coach, right? Like the, the fit feels really natural with Otzelberger. I think he'd probably be my top pick right now, but how, how do you feel about, Iowa State's TJ Otzelberger. I, I like him a lot. And I was really surprised to see him be the last two seed in in there in UConn region. That was that was real strange, especially after they went and, and just destroyed Houston in the Big 12 tournament. I thought Baylor that was before that too. Yeah. 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 That was surprising to say the least. I thought I thought they were potentially going to get a one seed over North Carolina or or at least be a higher two seed, but I talked about Otzelberger the other day on our podcast, and this is a guy who has turned Iowa State around. It's almost the exact opposite of of <laughs> what Juan Howard has done, if I'm being honest. I, Iowa State was 2-22 and 22 in the 2020 20, – 20, it was either 1920 or 2021 and because this is Otzelberger's third year. And in three seasons, he's taken them from two and twenty-two and winless in the Big Twelve to now a two seed and and uh, one of the favorites to go to the Final Four. They just they they just destroyed Houston, a number one seed in the in the Big Twelve tournament, and the Cyclones are are clicking on all cylinders right now. And and he's totally changed that program around. And you know, I I think I if I remember right, his buyout is large yeah so that's that's we've been told money won't be an option but we hear that a lot right yeah um he does have a large buyout yeah so So we'll have to see what happens there and obviously things could be delayed a little bit if iowa state makes a run but he if i was ward manual he would probably be my number my, my first call yeah midwest ties i can't remember a lot of these guys have Midwest ties, so now I'm getting it mixed up. I can't remember if he was Minnesota, Wisconsin. He's, he's one of those two. <laughs> but Midwest ties, this is his third stint at Iowa State. He was an assistant coach twice there. So I, I don't know if that's a situation where he's happy and comfortable where he is anyway. But, yeah, obviously the buyout comes into play. But, yeah, I'm with you. That that would be – the fit just seems so obvious in, yeah. in terms of the Michigan culture, right? If I don't think it has to be a Michigan person. And at this point, you know, Nate Oates was really the only, I mean, that's not Michigan university of Michigan, but he was really the only guy that, that made sense in that way. And then again, Haynes and beeline really. So I don't think you have to do the Michigan man game this time, (laughs) hopefully, but uh, the next one, go ahead. Sorry. one One more thing on odds. It'll be interesting to see if now that he's taken Iowa state, to essentially the top of college basketball, you almost have to wonder if he's just going to build there. I don't, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if there's that big of a, of a jump. I, I, I think it's almost more lateral than it is a jump up from Iowa state to Michigan. It might uh, not. It, we got to be honest about that. That's a good point. Yeah. I, I like, don't know if he would get in as high up, but that might not be the big 12 is the best basketball conference right yep. now. Yep. So Michigan's Michigan's a bigger brand than Iowa State is, but based on based on the way the two programs are set up right now, I, I almost wonder if he's just gonna build at Iowa State. So 
Well, from a salary know. standpoint too, like basketball coaches, I mean, other than like Calipari's, a lot of the best coaches are in that like three to 5 million range. Mm-hmm. Right. So like, if you come in and want to pay a guy like Otzelberger seven or eight, like Iowa state can match, right. This isn't a situation where with football, you can kind of just blow away somebody with a money offer. So yeah, I don't know that that's an obvious step up for him. Fair or not. I mean, it sucks. That's what <laughs> Michigan is right now. And that's where he has Iowa state. Yep. Uh, it would be a step up for Dusty May, right? He, yes. He's the name that I've seen attached to me, every job, um, <laughs> Louisville especially, right? Yep. Um, FAU with the Final Four run last year. That makes me nervous, right? They, they have essentially the same roster this year and ended up in an 8-9, right? They were kind of one of those bubble teams, ended up in the 8-9, I believe, Um if I'm comparing him to say Drake's Darian DeVries, who has a longer stretch of sustained success, a very high level, I just get nervous about the guy that makes that big tourney run. Yep. And then immediately becomes a head coach. If, if you're in that range of those two mid majors, I, I vastly prefer, prefer uh, DeVries. I, I agree. And there's just something, it's a little skeptical about a guy. Obviously, very respectable. A, fi- a final four run is, is not easy, but you almost have to wonder if it was a little bit of lightning in a bottle rather than a guy who, who built up a program and was actually capable of, of making it to the final four. Obviously he did, but you have to wonder if it was a, a, a true run or if it was something, I mean, we, we've seen essentially fluke final fours before Lo- Loyola Chicago was in the final four back in 2018 when Michigan beat them. And <laughs> uh, I mean, they're Florida Gulf coast. They were, they made a run they're, We've seen f- kind of fluke runs before. And, and you almost have to wonder if Florida Atlantic was, was one of those teams, but well, I, I guess we'll see. I think they play Northwestern in that eight, nine game again this year. And then the winner will play Yukon. If, if, if I remember right. And it, if, if Dusty may can go and, and, beat Northwestern and then beat UConn again at, to advance to the sweet 16. That, that might, that might uh, get another look from ward manual, but I don't know. That's it's, 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 it's tricky with that because you have to wonder if it was a fluke or if, if dusty may is, is he really knows what he's doing there at Florida Atlantic, but I agree with you. I, I'd, I'd go with Darian DeVries uh, and his resume before I'd go with dusty Mays. And you brought up the two tournament runs that I think are the reason I get the most pause. So the Florida Gulf coast coach, I cannot remember his name for the life of me right now. went to USC. He's been there for a while. And I think they had like an elite eight run in there when they had, um, my gosh, my memory is killing me today. He's Cleveland Cavaliers center. But anyway, I think they had a good run, but they've been kind of middle of the road and Porter Moser, one of the guys listed on here, Oklahoma fans are trying to chase him out, right? There was rumors he was going to go to DePaul to get back to the the Chicago area. Um, Dusty May is from Illinois, graduated from Indiana. So I know some Indiana fans are hoping they might go his route. But yeah, I'm just hesitant with that. And and maybe Colorado State's, thank you, Evan Mobley and Andy Enfield. Thank you, guys. (laughs) I'm so out of it today. Um, Nico Medved, obviously, we saw Colorado State in the tournament a couple years ago. He was a really hot name after that run. He, he's been there. He's got some contract extensions as well. So he's got a buyout in place too. So it, he's been a really popular name. And I, I'm in a similar boat where I'm like, yeah, he's had some success, but does that translate to Michigan? Yeah. it. it Colorado State, they're in, aren't they, this year? they, they, get, they I can't remember. Uh I think they were in that West region maybe. And I, I can't remember what, what their seed was or what their matchup is, but Nico Medved's a guy that he's, he's a good coach, but I don't know if he'd be capable of succeeding at Michigan. He kind of seems like a guy that can thrive in a, I don't know if Colorado state's technically a mid major or a high major, but they're not Michigan. And I, I think Michigan would be a whole nother beast. Obviously, the same could be could be said for for Dusty May at Florida Atlantic or or Darian DeVries at Drake, but 
I don't know. So, I just don't know if Medved would be the best candidate. Yeah, it, it I'll tell you what, the the uh committee was not a fan of that Mountain West this year. <laughs> They, they did not get as many teams as expected and the seeds weren't great. So yeah, they had the one, the tournament they got in that Michigan knocked them out of. And in an interesting point, he was replaced by Derry and DeVries at Drake and DeVries run at Drake has been better than what Medved did. So it's just kind of a interesting thing having those two. I've got, I've got other names listed. Moser is one that, you know, you have to consider maybe the Oklahoma thing wasn't a fit. He's a Midwest guy that comes over. Kyle Smith was Washington State's coach. I've seen Jamie Dixon starting to get listed. I don't know what the the chances are of him leaving TCU are. The the name I wanted to touch on here though that is kind of intriguing. And again, I don't know what the you know mutual receptiveness would be to this. But when we talk about the obstacles at Michigan, Northwestern and what Chris Collins has done at a school that literally had never been to the tournament before yep, is very intriguing to me just from a look, I, I either need a coach that's going to come in and, and be a change agent and, and do the things that the extra mile with the boosters and do what you can with an NIL or somebody that's proven they can succeed in an environment like this. And, and Collins kind of chicks the bill, right? <laughs> no floor slappers. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, that, I, that meme of him on the ground is still an all-time favorite for me. <laughs> but anyway, just a name I, I wanted to call out. <laughs> yeah. I I think he'd be a, a good candidate, but I think I read something that said he – someone asked him about it, and he said he wouldn't be interested, and if he was offered, he would turn yeah. it down. I think I read that somewhere on Twitter either earlier today or, or yesterday, but – and Nick Saban is still the coach of the Miami Dolphins. So yeah, <laughs> no. yeah, I, I don't know. He, he's a name I've seen start to come up, but I thought it was intriguing. The I guess the point is right now, the list seems to be getting bigger, which is a good thing. And you know, getting the the third party involved and then hearing money's not an issue. Okay, we're we're gonna have to wait a few days though, and, and maybe a couple weeks, depending on how the tournament goes, to kind of start to get some smoke on who are legitimate candidates in terms of we've seen some interest reciprocated back, right? Yep. To your point, it's really easy for me to drop a guy like Collins or everybody's excited about Otzenberger. Right. But if, if they don't want to come, then <laughs> they're not candidates. Right. So um, we've had a little bit of Intel early on from Josh over at Michigan.rivals.com. If you're not a subscriber already though, obviously with the coaching search beginning, now is the time to join and we were going to have a promo launch anyway with Michigan football spring camp kicking off. So you can get 50% off right now your entire first year using promo code repeat2024 at michigan.rivals.com. If you go to my Twitter account, Josh's Twitter account, I don't know about you, Brock, but we, we have it pinned on the top of our Twitters right now. So you can just click that link and it auto fills in. I know we have a lot of subscribers and regular viewers in here right now. So I always say if you guys have any questions or Want to know if it's worth joining? Ask them. We're, we're really proud of the community and the folks over there. So, basketball out of the way. Let's get to what everybody wants to talk about. Michigan football. Spring practice kicking off this week. Um, I feel like I have to do this every week. So, the elephant in the room for this one that we're going to get out of the way. Um, obviously, the unfortunate incident this weekend. New defensive line coach, Greg Scruggs, was given an OWI in an arbor. It sounds like it was around 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, Sharon Moore has issued a statement that, um, you know, Scruggs was not making excuses and then was, you know, obviously really upset about the whole situation. He has been suspended indefinitely. Um, I don't really want to get into the, the speculating game here at all, obviously. Um, but the facts are, this is his third related incident, um, at Louisville. He had one and was, it was kicked off the team. And then in Seattle, it was um, pled down to, I think, reckless driving or something like that. So either way, whether he returns or doesn't, um, if he returns, I'd imagine there, there's probably going to be a length of time. Um, they'll probably set him up with you know, some treatment or, or whatever needs to happen to make sure that, that he's okay, which is the most important thing. But obviously, right before spring practice, not a, not a great thing. I, I don't know if he's going to be a factor with the defensive line anytime soon, at least, but 
yeah, it's not the most ideal time for something like this to be happening, especially when it happens 10 days, I think is what it was after he was officially hired. Yeah. Not a good look, but we did talk a few weeks ago when we were going over the, the spring roster. Um, I think it was back in, in late February sometime. And we talked about the defensive line and how these are guys that can are pretty capable of coaching themselves, right? Mason Graham, Kenneth Grant, these guys know what they're doing. They're, they're two of the best defensive tackles in all of college football. And then you got Derek Moore, Josiah Stewart. These guys, obviously you'd like a coach. You need a coach, right? It's not like these guys can just go uncoached, but these guys have experience, right? And maybe you'd like to have a coach there during spring ball for the younger guys to get developed and things like that. But it's, it's not definitely not the most detrimental thing that, that could have happened. That's for sure. Yeah. And luckily he didn't hurt anyone and, and he's okay. Um, you know, I, I don't know the names right now and I'm sure we'll find out once spring kicks out that, that there's going to be an analyst that'll be coaching and, and wink will probably be involved. I mean, they're going to make this work. Right. But um, yeah, just unfortunate, ugly. It, it is what it is. So uh, we don't know anything. And, and like I said, I don't want to, I am hardly in a position to, to cast a stone. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see what he and more and, and Ward Manuel in Michigan ultimately decide moving forward. So, um, but players roster, right. That, that this is uh, an interesting time defending national champions, but also feels like we're, we're completely starting from scratch. So interesting comments regarding what's going to be the biggest storyline, which is who is the quarterback? Uh, Kurt Campbell, uh, press availability this week said there are five quarterbacks competing. So he is including Jack Tuttle, who, for those who don't know, did get eligible, eligible, <laughs> killing me today. He got a waiver. There you <laughs> go. Got, yeah, he's a waiver. Out. Yeah, eligibility waiver. Uh, he's going to have another year. He comes in. Alex Orgy, Jane Dengal are, are the two from the juniors that we expected to compete. Davis Warren is back. I don't know if people realized he had a shoulder injury last year that really impacted not just his progress, but even his ability to throw when he was out there. And then Jane Davis, the freshman, he was included in that battle. Um, I think ultimately – if he has a real strong showing and, and earns the, the job as a freshman, then wow. Uh, but I think ultimately the, the expectation is probably he would be in some in position to redshirt. But anyway, he, he made it clear. I mean, he's literally organizing the depth chart. He said based on age. And then when it comes to orgy and Denegal, he's going to go alphabetical for day <laughs> one. So there are no early favorites, but he said, they're literally going to look at this every single day and make adjustments as they get through spring camp. So what are your thoughts on the five-way battle as, as spring camp kicks off? It's it's going to be fascinating. I can't wait to watch it play out because you have five guys that are all unique in their own way. Jack Tuttle is this experienced older guy. He's not the most talented by any means, but he's experienced, and he's he's played more football than any of these guys have in, in college. You've got Alex Orgy, the 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 super athlete, the guy who's gonna run a a four four or four four five forty and run people over. We saw a little bit of a little bit of it in the Ohio State game. I mean, he was that twenty yard carry was huge for Michigan on that one drive in, in the second half. And then you've got Jaden Denegal, who I don't I wouldn't say he has any elite traits, but he's competing, right? They, they've mentioned his name. It's not like he's right. It's not like he's just some walk on that, that they, that they don't ever mention. And you've got Davis Warren, who's played a lot of football too. He's, he's up there with Jack Tuttle and, and obviously the injury kind of derailed him. He didn't look great in the time that he had on the field last year, but two, two seasons ago, he was, he was the he was the backup behind JJ McCarthy. Yeah. And, the expectation was he was probably going to be the backup this year. Yep and get reps and potentially put himself in position to be the starter this year. And then obviously that, that didn't happen. And that's kind of knocked the perception of him, but yeah. And, and then Jaden Davis, the, the young talented freshman. And like you said, if, if he comes into this battle and wins it, I think Michigan fans should be very excited for the 2024 season, because if you have a freshman that goes in there and beats out a, a, 
seventh year guy, uh, an incredible athlete amongst others. That's, that's very exciting for, for in terms of the ceiling that, that Michigan can have in 2024. So very fascinated to see how it plays out. And I'm also fascinated to see if the staff ultimately determines that they want to look to the portal. Right. I mean, that's still an option too. So we're gonna have to see what happens after spring ball, but definitely it's the biggest position battle on the team this in this off season. So looking forward to it. And I wonder how quickly they're going to narrow it down because you, you can't be giving out number one reps to five guys all spring. Yep. Right. And I think going into the summer, you'd like to have a good two to three. You feel good about. Um, I, I think you nailed it. I think Tuttle is a floor. Having him back is a good floor to have. Yep. He's never carried starter reps <laughs> throughout an entire season. So that would be a challenge. But one thing that stuck out to me, you know, Kirk Campbell talked about, it's not just going to be a talent thing. You know, they have to replace JJ wasn't just the best quarterback in Michigan history per Jim Harbaugh because of his throwing ability. It was also his incredible leadership, right? And that there's a huge void on this team right now, at least perception of leaders. And the coaches have talked about that, right? So who steps up in that department, how he mentioned how they carry themselves in meetings and practice, just all of that. Do you look like a starting quarterback, right? Yep. Are you doing the business of being a starting quarterback is going to be a factor. That's a spot where Tuttle probably has an edge. Um, mm -hmm. Orgy's a guy that but Campbell said he's already proved they can trust him. You know, I know it was only running the ball. They did have the one play call where he was supposed to throw it and he chose not to, which was the yep. right decision. But yep. for them to be able to put him into those big moments and big games, he's already proven that. We've heard he's improved as a passer. We haven't seen it, right? So there's an unknown there. Same thing with Denegal. Campbell has said he's the most improved player on the roster last year, arguably. We haven't really seen it, but he's that prototypical quarterback. And then, yeah, if Warren can find that gear again. And, yeah, you're right. The interesting thing about Jaden Davis is there is no scenario. Often I think a freshman QB can win by default because he is the top recruit and there's really nobody yep. better. He's not winning this job by default. No, there's no chance. So if he actually beats all these guys out on a team that I don't think is super interested in starting a freshman, that would be very intriguing. I don't think it's going to happen. Nothing on him. He has a lot of those intangibles and things you'd like to see. He's already been around the program since the Rose Bowl. Yep. I would be very, you're right though. If he did win the job, I would be very excited. Um, I have no idea who I think it's going to be. One day I think it's Orgy. <laughs> And then I think it's Tuttle, and then yeah, yep. and then the portal piece. It depends who jumps in. It does right? It, it it doesn't seem like there are a whole lot of like really good elite quarterbacks out there right now, and the ones that are elite are starters at their schools. Right. And we saw Will Howard transfer from Kansas State to Ohio State, and people aren't even convinced that he's that great. So it he lost the job at Kansas State. Yeah. He's kind of their Cade McNamara. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, no, I've said I, I think he's a downgrade from Accord, but that, I mean that's a whole different story. <laughs> but um, obviously, you know, if he was here, he might be arguably the, the top QB already. So, I guess we're not one to judge. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah it, if the right name goes in the portal, and you go for him for sure. But yeah, it's interesting too when when Tuttle first announced he was coming back for a seventh year. In my opinion, I was like, okay, there's there's your starter first game one right against Fresno state on, on August 31st. But I'm kind of like you in the sense I've gone back and forth a little bit. Some days I think it's Alex orgy and, and you just ride with his athleticism. And some days, some days I do, I think it's Jaden Davis, but I don't know. It's, it's going to be so fun to watch these guys battle it out. And if, if, if Jaden Davis somehow wins it, that that's another thing too, that you were talking about with, with leadership, and things like that. I do think it'll be hard for Jaden Davis to walk in there and take command in, in a way yeah. that, that these guys want to want to go to battle with him. You know, Jim Harbaugh always said that he'd follow JJ McCarthy to hell and back. And I do think it's going to be tough for, for, for Jaden Davis to walk in there and have that effect uh, on the team right away. Uh, so we're going to see, it's going to be fun. It is. Yeah. And who, who can be accurate and not turn the ball over who, you know, who can hit the, the speed receivers 
orgies run game element of it. Yeah, it's it's interesting because like you said, they all they're all very different, and we really don't know a bunch about them in terms mm-hmm. of like how they're gonna be in games. One of the negatives of last year was we really didn't get to see these guys tested in a potential replace JJ scenario. Yep. Um, and then yeah, it, it in terms of the portal, you know, the one name I've been hearing to keep an eye on is potentially um, Preston Stone, SMU's QB, who's coming off an injury. He's going to graduate in the spring, potentially enter as a grad transfer. Um, I know we, people people keep saying they think Jayla Bill Rowe, you know, whatever, but <laughs> I don't see that, obviously. More than likely, you know, we've talked about if somebody's entering the portal for Michigan, it's going to be the same thing. It's a guy that got beat out in a depth chart battle at his school. Yep. And then they're coming in late and what's that going to do? So I, I think unless something super obvious happens, I think we're probably looking at these five, mm-hmm. but yeah. And I put it up there. Average fan brought up. Yeah. The, the spring game overreactions will be <laughs> legendary. Uh, they, they always are, but it's, it's going to be another level this year. Um, ben, ben Hall was a all American running back after, after the spring. Hey, game he last. got, yeah, he got Peyton, hurt. Peyton O'Leary was an all big 10 receiver too. Oh, Peyton O'Leary is my favorite one. <laughs> and look, he might have, he's, he's going to have an opportunity this year if he can actually get out there fourth year. But um, yeah. you, you brought up Ben Hall because I, and I want to get to the running backs real quick too, because I do think there's an interesting dynamic there we've touched on a little bit. And I think whoever the quarterback is, their number one priority is just going to be handing the ball off, right? They're, they're going to lean on the run game. There's no doubt yeah. about that. You brought up Ben Hall. If he's healthy, I think he's got a chance to, to, to carve out a role as in that RB three, we, we, he did look good in the spring game. I agree with you. We have to <laughs> see it more. Uh, Cole Cabana has not been on the field. He was dealing with an injury as well. Jordan Marshall is a freshman that from a skill set and mindset standpoint, I think can contribute as a freshman, but the, the running backs this year are Kalel Mullings and Donovan Edwards. Yep. That, that's one and two right now. I think some people are putting it Edwards as, as RB one and that there's no conversation whatsoever. I do think there's a conversation. We've talked about it a little bit about whether look Edwards is going to get carries. There's no doubt about that. He was already arguably wide receiver three last year in terms of target and receptions, a lot of short throws. They only tested him deep. Like the one time against Purdue, I think. Um, but we're, where do you see the balance here with, with, with Mullings and Edwards is Edwards going to just be the clear bell cow RB one, or, or do you think we could see Edwards in a similar role that he was this year? And Mullings is the RB one. I do see Edwards as the RB one, but I see Kalal Mullings as like the RB one and a half. Yeah. If that makes sense. I don't think it's going to be a one and two. And I, I see this argument brought up a lot online where, they say, oh, you know, Donovan Edwards breaks out when he gets RB1 carries. Like in, in, in games where he gets 15 to 20 carries, Donovan Edwards breaks out. You right. know, you see Ohio State 2022. Uh, TCU, he had that one that one big long run to start the game. Purdue in the Big Ten Championship two years ago, he was big. I, I buy into that. Because I do think if if you give Donovan Edwards 15 to 20 carries, he's going to break one long one. But Kalel Mullings is a guy who has to play. I mean, we, we talked about this the entirety of last season. He gets five yards every carry. Every carry. He's he's a bulldozer. And you you, you just can't sit him. I, I don't see how Michigan is going to be able to, to live with giving Donovan Edwards 20 carries a game and Kalel Mullings five. I, I don't see a scenario where that happens at all. I see it more as probably 15 for Edwards, 10 for Mullings. I I don't know. I, I, I think it's going to be very even. I don't see a scenario where Edwards gets all the yards and touchdowns and Mullings just comes in, you know, once every three drives or something like that. I think it's going to be a lot more rotational than, than people might be expecting. And it could be, it could go beyond those two, right? We we've seen Michigan use three, four backs pretty consistently in the past. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm with you. Steve Horn brings it up. I think what what gets me in the mode that I think Mullings is going to be a bigger factor than people realize is the situational part of it, especially with a new quarterback and without JJ, who was just 
bailing you out on third down. His third down and long numbers are incredible, right? You're losing that this year. There's no way around it. I, I would be absolutely just shocked if there's a quarterback on this roster that can do what JJ McCarthy did on third and long, right? So getting the three to five yards on first down, second down is more important than ever. And that, that guy is Kalel Mullings to me yep. <laughs> that gets yep. you those five yards, the extra couple yards. Somebody brought up the Haskins comparisons. I think the Son Haskins comparisons are super obvious with the linebacker conversion, the size. Mm-hmm. He does have some good cuts. He's been able to break some runs too, but when it comes to, yeah, the, those early downs and the short yardage, I think Mullings is still the dude. I, I think Ed, I'd love to see them both on the field at the same time a lot. Right. And, you, and you're yeah. moving Edwards out or you're doing options or whatever you're doing. Edwards has got to be involved in the passing game. You would think this year, especially without the clear number one going into the year. Um, but Mullings has got to get carries. He just absolutely yes. has to. So, and maybe it's a hot hand situation too. Maybe it's game by game. Yep. You know, maybe that's how they're doing it. But Edwards is always that guy that you, you're wearing down the, the defense and he's just going to, bur- I mean, I know his two touchdowns against Washington were early in the game, right? But what he did against Ohio state, you know, and, and every time, every time I talk myself out of it, you, you're right. You bring it up. His success as an RB one was there, right? The yeah. make was gone in 22. So it, it's interesting, but in yeah. spring, it'll be, it'll be fun to see if we get any, uh, I don't know, any clues in terms of if one of those guys is with the ones a lot or, or anything like that. But yeah, it's going to be interesting. And going back to Steve's comment that was up on the screen, I wouldn't be surprised if Kalil Mullings finished the season with more touchdowns than Donovan Edwards did, just because right. Michigan is so good in, in that, in that short yardage goal line scenario. And we saw it last year where, where Jim Harbaugh didn't feel entirely comfortable putting Donovan Edwards in, in that role. It was Blake Corum basically every time. And I figure Sharon Moore will feel the same way. I think he's going to see Kalel Mullings as, as, as that short yardage back. And when Michigan gets to the goal line, I, I do think they'll go to Mullings. And I, I definitely wouldn't be surprised if he finishes with more touchdowns than, than Edwards does. I don't know about a thousand thousand Detroit Lions fans, but said would shock me if he was a thousand thousand player this year. I think Donovan Edwards needs to be, a 1,500 this year. Yeah. I, I think he, I think he can rush for a thousand. He almost rushed for a thousand yards in 22 after being injured and, and playing behind Blake in just those four games. He, I think he ended up being at like 992 because of how much he amassed at the end of the year. So he's got to rush for a thousand and man, I don't, you could, he could be wide receiver one if they get him outside enough. Like he's probably the best receiver on the team as crazy as that is to say, but yeah, I wanted to see where you were on that split. Um, and then you brought, I'll ask you last question on running backs, just because the way you talk, do you think Ben Hall, hype, Ben Hall hype is not there? Or do you, or do you think Ben Hall is going to be a factor this year? I think he'll be a small factor. I, I not, do not the spring game hype level though. Huh? No, no. <laughs> I think he, I think he'll go for, 200, 250 yards and two or three touchdowns. He'll, I mean, he'll, he'll probably be running back three, but 2025 will probably be his breakout season. He's got talent. He really does, but he's, he's just not on, on the level of Donovan Edwards and Kalel Mullings yet. So he'll be, he'll, he'll be there. He'll have a role. It'll be small, but I do think he'll, he'll see the field quite a bit. I was just so impressed after you know, a lot of the criticism he got towards the end of his senior year and fall. And then even at the bowl practices, he did not look good. There were some videos that were getting shared and like just different drills they were doing. And it was like, Oh man. And then he showed up at spring in incredible shape and then took advantage of a lot of running back injuries. Um, yeah, there's signs there. I'm with you. He's, he's not going to cut into those reps significantly, but he's just another big power back on a team that I think is going to really, lean on that type of runner. So yeah. before we get to the defense, I, I don't know. I don't, I mean, the wide receiver we can get into too, but I, I the offensive line, I think it, it's surprisingly not a bigger storyline <laughs> because I mean, quarterback's going to dominate the conversation, but we just talked about, you know, a quarterback that's going to need to be comfortable 
as a new starter. And we just talked about running backs that are going to need to be able to do work. Both of those guys need a strong F offensive line. And we're going to have five new starters this year, no matter what. I mean, Miles Hinton got some starts last year, obviously start of the year, but like you've lost the, the full starting lineup that you finished with at the end of the year. Um, how, how do you feel about that group going in? I know we've talked some names as far as starters. You, you can mention that as well, but do you have any concern about a, a big drop off with that offensive line? Or do you think they're going to figure this out? I think they'll figure it out, but it's, it's going to be other than quarterback. It's going to be the most important position group on the team because That's Michigan's entire identity is running the football and you can't run the football if you don't have a good offensive line. And there's got to be at least, I don't want to, I don't want to use the word concern, but there's got to be a little bit of wondering amongst the staff. If the five guys that they start for 2024 are going to be capable of keeping that team's identity where it's been the last three years, I don't think it's reasonable to expect them to be as good as probably any of the last three years on the offensive line, just because like you mentioned, it's five new starters. They're all going to be kind of younger guy, not younger, but not as experienced as guys like Zach and Trevor yeah. Keegan. So it's, it's going to be interesting, but they're going to have to do it because that's the identity of the team. I think Sharon Moore will do whatever it takes to make sure that offensive line is clicking by week one, because Everyone knows Michigan runs the ball 25, 30 times a game, and that's the identity. It's been that way the last three years. That's how they won the, the three Big Ten titles in the national championship. And, you know, a few, week, few weeks ago we talked about potential starters. I think Greg Crippen is about as close to a lock as it gets at center. And Josh Preeb, or Preeby, I don't, I don't know how. I think it's how, Preeb. Preeb, okay. I'm sure he, I'm wrong because I'm always wrong, but <laughs> – He's he's a lock at at I don't know what you want to call it left or right one, guard yeah one, one of the guard spots yeah yep and then El Hadi is is probably a lock at the other one whichever one that may be his I I guess El Hadi would probably be left guard I, Pre would be right if I had to make a, a I don't pick know Pre's only started at left guard too so yeah I don't know how that I mean that's going to be the, an interest I'm with you that's your interior. I'd be shocked if those aren't the three of the interior, but yeah, where a hottie goes and where pre goes will be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And then those, those three are, are essentially locks at this point heading into spring for me. The, the, the interesting part is going to be the tackles. And this is kind of where Michigan was at last year. Yes. In, in terms of, of offensive line battles, you've got in, in my mind, three guys, it's, it's miles Hinton, it's Andrew Gentry and it's Jeff Percy. Yep. And it, it's, three guys for two spots. Whereas last year it was four guys in, in Henderson, Hinton Jones and Barnhart. Um, so yeah, it's that that's where I'm looking. It is tackles. The, 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 the Crippen at center is a lock and, and Preeb and Al Hadi at, at the guard spots are pretty much locks at this point, in my opinion. So definitely interested to see, interested to see what happens at tackle. Yeah. Cause to your point, you could make the argument there were no tackles last year. Jones, Barnhart, and Henderson yeah. are probably more naturally guards. Yeah. Right? And, and we saw that become an issue against the best pass rushers. Chop Robinson obviously comes to mind in that Penn State game, right? Yeah. So having true tackle play, there's a potential for an upgrade there. I'm glad you corrected yourself on the word young. Because yeah. there's one thing this offensive line's not going to be, and it's young, right? Yep. Crippen's a senior, Ahadi's a senior, Preeb is a grad transfer, Miles Hinton's year six, and Andrew Gentry is in his third season, but he's 24 years old because he yep. took a two year mission trip, right? So, like, that's a grown man off of the <laughs> line. Like, you're talking the entire line will not have a ton of experience, but they're going to be 24 and 25 years old, right? <laughs> and just from a physical standpoint, I think that's a huge advantage. Um, I like to read between the lines and when spring happens. And I think Greg Crippen's involvement in the events with other players and things like that, it's been pretty clear that they are rewarding him 
for sticking through the couple yep. of years where Olu comes in, Drake Nugent comes in. You know, we we heard throughout camp that he was right there with Nugent, um, yep. that he could probably start on almost any other team, etc. Again, a team looking for leaders. This guy who's just grinded, and, and it seems like it's his turn, and he's going to take full advantage of it. But they're they're including him with the Love Wins and and the Donovans. You see him in, in these type of groups. I think that's a big sign to me. El Hadi's a similar spot. If if Zinter and Keegan don't come back last year, he's surely a starter. He doesn't transfer. He waits his turn. You get the experience of pre. The other thing reading between the lines is uh, I think Steve mentioned it. Yeah. Campbell was trying to talk up Hinton. I still think Hinton is probably the right tackle. And I think Gentry is going to take that step to be the left tackle. It's a former top 100 recruit that didn't play football for two years going into his third year of football at Michigan. I, I think he'll be in position to take that leap. If not, we've seen Percy start. You brought him up at left tackle, whatever. I think they know they need Hinton to be good. Yep. And and consistent. And they've said that already when he got here. Look, he's got potential to be just one of the he's what six eight three forty. The dude's yeah. a monster. Yep. Um and I think they probably want him to, to be the starting left tackle. Gentry, it was interesting because Gentry last year was initially kind of playing some right guard and then he got left tackle snaps, and then Percy got snaps at right guard and mop up duty. So that was kind of interesting. Um yeah, Steve said that they were talking about hitting it left. Yeah, I think that's what they want. I think they want Hinton to take the, the the big leap and be that physically daunting left tackle, whether he can or not. Right. Yeah, yeah. He Hinton was a guy like you mentioned before. He started the year as a starter, and he was a little inconsistent. He showed flashes, but he was inconsistent, and that's when he eventually got replaced by Henderson and. They, I think they did some some mixing up of the the guards and tackles. Yeah, Barhart, uh, early in the season. Barhart moved back over to right. Yeah, yeah. So you definitely like for him to be more consistent in in twenty twenty four. But like everyone's mentioned, he he's a huge guy. I mean, just a mammoth of a human being, and he's not gonna if he can be consistent, he's not gonna let many guys buy him. And at the most at the most important position on the offensive line protecting the quarterback's blind side. If he does play left tackle, he's got to be good. And like you said, the staff knows that they need him to be good. And I think he will be. I, I think he may have been playing a little conservative or uh, I don't know a better way to put it, but he, he, he knew there was competition there. And I think, yeah, I think, uh, he, he knew there were people behind him. So we'll see. I, I he, He's got to be good, though. That's for sure. I think you're onto something. I think he just needs somebody to believe in him. Yeah. You know, and, and get that chance to to be because he after he lost the job and he was hurt, you know, before the Nebraska game and then he came back. He actually looked really good as they were slowly bringing him back on. And then was it Maryland? He got hurt. I think it was the Maryland game where it looked like he got hurt really badly. Luckily it wasn't, but he was starting to, to look better and more consistent. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting. I, I wanted to, I pulled up the snaps because I, I wanted to see this. Cause I remember talking about this previously when I was saying with the, the Gentry and Percy thing after playing left tackle in 22, Percy took 77 snaps last year and every single one was at right guard. Wow. So he didn't play tackle at all last year. Gentry had initially been taking the snaps at right guard. He had 23 there. Then they moved him over to left tackle where the, he had 18, but he also took four snaps at guard and four snaps at right tackle. Huh. So what that says to me is they want him on the field in some position, right? And yeah. Newsom, Newsom has said that before um, where – the strategy is finding the five best guys, right? Not being yep. locked into position. I think there's always that thing in the back of your mind because there's a difference between tackle and guard. There just Absolutely. is, right? And and with you kind of knowing who your guards are going to be, I don't see Preeb. I don't see El Hadi moving out to tackle. I, I do think this is a battle for tackles. Yep. But yep. All right, let's move to the defense real quick. We're already over an hour. Yay, let's go. <laughs> um, 
there's not a ton of questions on the defense. There's the not level, not at all. Right? It, it's I don't think people realize. I know Michigan fans do. We already see people there. Like, look, you've got this elite defense. You can pair with one of these quarterbacks and be good enough, probably. Right. Yep. Um, I want to start with the defensive front. Wink Martindale talking about. I mean, he's excited. Right. He is excited yep. about this defensive front, specifically the starters, Mason Grant, Kenneth Grant, and you brought it up to Derek Moore, Josiah Stewart at the edge. Yeah, it's going to be. I want to say it's going to be the focal point of the defense, but when you look at the secondary, <laughs> that, I, 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 the whole defense is loaded. I mean, I, I don't know what else to say. I was talking about I was talking about it with some friends today. This defense, I'm, I'm going to veer away from the defensive line and honestly just into the whole defense the the defense in general is good enough to win michigan nine games yep at least i think in in, in 2024 you you might need whoever, whoever the quarterback might be you might need them to go out there and win you a game or two but the defense is going to win michigan nine or ten games in 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 2024 um, unless like injury in the injury bug strikes bad michigan, had a, michigan was pretty lucky with health last yep. year Yep. Yeah. And that, that was a huge part in, in them going on to win the national championship. But unless, unless you lose a guy like Mason Graham or Kenneth Grant or Rod Moore or Will Johnson or multiple of them, if you lose, if you lose a couple of your key contributors, contributors, that's where it could be a problem. But this defense is just too loaded. Like teams are not going to be able to score points on Michigan and, and you won't need to do much more than hand the ball off hand the ball off to Donovan Edwards and Kalel Mullings and just play good defense and Michigan will win games. If you want to look at the defensive line specifically, I, I saw today a quote from someone, I think it was related to, to PFF, that Mason Graham would be the number one defensive tackle taken in the NFL it's draft this year if he was eligible. Yeah. It, it's just unbelievable how, how talented these guys are and – they're only going into their junior years, Graham and Grant, that is. But I, I don't know. I just think they're going to manhandle offensive lines literally the entire season. Yeah, there's. I always talk about NFL caliber players and then having NFL talent, right? So when you have players on your roster who literally could be in the NFL, not yeah. like they have the caliber to someday be there. Like this year, they could be in the NFL, but they're on yep. your team. Yeah, that is just such a massive advantage. And that was a big reason why Michigan won the national championship last year. Zach Zinter and Trevor Keegan were NFL talent. They were capable to already be on NFL rosters. Chris yep. Jenkins is NFL talent, right? I think you could argue, like you said, Will Johnson and Mason Graham, we've seen enough people that aren't Michigan people say, look, these are first round picks in this year's draft if they were yep. eligible. Yep. Right. So that's not NFL caliber. That's NFL talent. They're already at that level. Rod Moore would have been an NFL draft pick. That's NFL talent coming yep. back. Right. So the, the question for me with the defensive line will be depth. I think it's going to be important to continue to be able to rotate. But in terms of starters, I think that might be the best defensive front in college football. I mean, Grant, yep. Grant and Moore, you got to double team one of them. Those are both not just run stuffers, but guys that can create pass rush. Derek Moore feels like he's going to take a big leap. Josiah Stewart from Nebraska on was already arguably the second best pass rusher. So, you know, if Rayshon Benny, he's a guy that I don't think people realized other, you know, not in pass rush, he didn't have the impact of Graham and Jenkins, but tackles, he was right there, almost the same numbers as Grant. Uh, he didn't miss a single tackle last year, right? Him coming in as a third defensive tackle. There's some young guys, Man, Steve's been reading my mind yep. all night. Trey Pierce is the guy to watch. It Damn sounds, Brian. yeah, it sounds like I wanted to clarify this because right after I posted my edge and defensive tackle pieces, I got some intel. It sounds like Cam Brandt will move inside and Eno Etta is expected to be that second strong side edge player behind Derek Moore, um, which got me very excited. I think Eno Etta has a chance to be a real force this year. Yeah. I, I didn't talk enough about the, backups because I was I don't want to call them backups but the second second and third stringers because I was so enamored with Grant and Graham but hard not to be <laughs> Trey Pierce Trey Pierce and, and Cam Brandt saw the field 
not a lot, but they were out there. It, it's not like they just sat and watched all 15 games. They were out on the field participating and, you know, developing those guys. That's that's one area where where this Scruggs suspension could come into play a little bit is, is how how are these guys developing during spring ball if they're if they don't have their coach there to coach them. So, yeah, it's I mean, it. I, I don't know what else to say about the defensive line. It's just, it, it's going to be unreal. Ray, Ray Sean Benny was a guy who he was really, he was really coming on up until he got hurt in the Rose bowl and, and obviously didn't play in the national championship, but they're going to, they're just going to be really, really good. I think in the same way that Kenneth Grant was blocked as a freshman by Mozzie Smith, I think Ray Sean Benny was blocked this year because you have Mason Graham, Kenneth Grant, and Chris Jenkins. Yep. And the little bit he played, he was fantastic. So him coming in to be, you know, the the third defensive tackle, you know, like uh old timer asked, who's gonna be the Jenkins and Cam Goods this year? Literally, Jenkins, you know, I, I think even if he has, is an edge, you know, Edda reminds me of Jenkins so much in terms of their build and skill set. But Cam Brandt is that other tweener guy that yep. You know, in high school, he played a lot of four three defensive ta- or excuse me, four three defensive end, hand of the dirt. So I think Brant has a good chance there. Cam Good was surprisingly good last year, right? Yep. Dude was a force of pass rush. I, I don't know if there's an actual comparison to him. Um in, in the spring, you know, we're not gonna see a lot of guys. There is a very talented group coming in uh, of defensive tackles with this freshman class with David Palapali, Owen Wafel. Um I I don't know how much they're going to play this year, but anybody who can show there won't be a drastic drop off. I, I think Michigan wants to rotate as much as possible to keep health there, but yeah. it, it's an elite group. Um, the linebackers, we know we have Ernest Hausman, Jay Sean Barham. They, they didn't make a lot of transfer moves. Prebe's a big one. Jay Sean Barham's a big one. Absolutely. What, what, what a perfect <laughs> replacement bringing those two in. And then, Again, there's some names that are coming through, but this we've seen Michael Barrett and Junior Colson largely lead this group by themselves. Yeah. In the last two years, right? Moten eventually got into a weird role before he left. Um, Hill Green was hurt, which is why Barrett even got the job. Last year, Houseman played, but not a ton. You'd think losing these two established starters would make you really anxious, but everyone's really excited about Houseman and Barham, man. Yeah, those those guys are studs. You know what you're going to get with them every Saturday. Hausman played a ton last year, and Barham, I'm sure everyone remembers his interception of, of J.J. McCarthy there in the Maryland game. His only non-Bowling Green interception. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But a, a, apart from that, guys I'm excited that, that could step into bigger roles. Jimmy Roller, he played quite a bit his freshman season, and then last year was dealing with, with injuries and, and – things like that. He kind of got exposed a little bit in the Ohio state game on that one play, but uh, yeah, Jimmy Rolder, Micah Pollard, Jaden hood guys that, that I'm excited about. They, they, in, in terms of getting blocked by people, it may not be to that degree in the, in the sense that it is in, in defensive line with, with Grant and Graham kind of taking up most of the playing time because I think they'll 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 try and rotate at linebacker quite a bit, but definitely excited about about those three guys in Rolder, Pollard, and, and Hood for sure. And they've got young guys that could become factors there too. Um, I know Hayden Moore is a guy people are excited about. Jason Hewlett's been called the best athlete on this team already coming into his sophomore year, and um, Samaj Bridgman is an interesting piece because just as how he was recruited and his body's developed. I don't know if he necessarily fits into a perfect mic role anymore, but I think he could carve out his own like Sam linebacker role potentially. So that that's a group that I love the starters. You have some veterans that maybe haven't played a lot. Like you mentioned hood and rolled through though, that could take a next step and contribute. And you have a lot of young guys, not even mentioning freshmen, Jeremiah Beasley, Cole Sullivan coming in. Yep. I do think Sullivan ends up at edge eventually, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, Steve asked Hewlett right now. He's been listed as a linebacker. Um, we'll see if he added another 20 or 30 pounds or whatever, if he moves to edge, but it sounds like he's going to be a factor at linebacker. Um, 
is the, is the roster going to come out tomorrow? Maybe. Spring, yeah, because because the I don't know. It depends. They do their measurements and then post. We'll we'll see. I mean, and honestly, with there might be things that are just different with more too, in terms of like the way some of the stuff rolls out. It, it'll it'll be interesting to see. But yeah, that's that's always the fun thing to everyone. If they if they gained weight, it's a good thing. If they lost weight, it's a good thing. Just remember that. <laughs> No matter what, no matter what changed with their weight, it's a good thing. Yeah. Um, put the secondary together as a group. Rod Moore, Macari Page back starters again. Obviously, that does lead to Keon Sab leaving. You know, he's going to go get starter level. I think he would have had a major role in this defense, but he clearly starter reps at Alabama Go Pro next year. That's his goal. Did find out Quentin Johnson is coming back. Another veteran piece. I think that's valuable as your third safety. Sab gone opens the door up for hopefully a healthy Zeke Barry to be a bigger contributor than Brandon Hellman is kind of like the next Sab, very yeah. similar play style sophomore at the corner spot. Th this is where we have a battle arguably, right? Will Johnson, no question. CB one best corner in college football. The nickel spot feels like that's just going to be Jaden McBurrows because he took over that backup role at the end of the year. Again, physical, but you've got 800 snaps from Mike Sainer still you're trying to replace. You're yeah. not going to do that with one dude. So it feels like Rod Moore, maybe Zeke Barry, the safety role could contribute there. And then once again, CB2. <laughs> same spot that, as last year. Same spot as last year. That that will be the, the position battle of the spring. Who starts across from Will Johnson? If I had to make a pick right now, I'd go DJ Waller. But it could also be Jair Hill. Yeah, those and are the two it feels like. It, it, it could be down to them too, or Michigan could go to, back to the portal. I mean, I don't think Josh Wallace gets enough credit for what he did last year in, in terms of, of holding down that second cornerback spot. He was – I that that pickup, when, I think they picked him up in June. Yeah. That was a right. very – it was a very low-risk, high-reward pickup. And it turned out to be very high reward because he came up big in, in some pretty key moments. He he recovered that fumble in the Rose Bowl, made a tackle late in the game in overtime in that same game. He, he was just really, really good. I don't even know if the Michigan staff was, um, was thinking he was going to be that good, but I guess that's enough about last year. We're on to 2024 now, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, now I miss, now I miss Josh Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, DJ Waller would be my pick to start across from Will Johnson. If the season started tomorrow, he'd be my pick. But um, Jaden McBurrows for sure at nickel, I think, as of right now. I, I want to see how they mix in Rod Moore because I do think he'd be capable of doing that. Yes. And then you could go Page and Johnson at, at safety, at, at, at deep and free safety, that is. Um, because, yeah, it's going to be tough for – McBurrows to come in after not playing a whole lot last year and, and fully taking over that, that nickel spot that saying we're still going to leave behind. Like you mentioned, that's going to be really tough for, for him to do. I do think, I mean, this is Rod Moore's senior season and he's been starting since like midway through his freshman year. Mm -hmm. This guy has a lot of snaps under his belt too. So I think mixing him in there at nickel wouldn't be a terrible idea. It's really where he came on was filling in for Dax Hill, which Dax had kind of become the nickel safety hybrid, a little bit different than the Usainer still, but that, that was Dax Hill's role. And that was really how Moore kind of came in. So yeah, he could absolutely be a factor there. Um, I, I brought up Zeke Barry just because, you know, Sab was more of like a safety linebacker hybrid, if you will, a little bit more physical able to, to impact the run game was good in pass rush. It, it feels like Barry is more of a corner safety hybrid. So it, yeah, how they, how they use those guys is going to be compelling the corner side. I think I'm with you. DJ Waller was having a sneaky good freshman year up until yeah. what, about Michigan state. They kind of just settled in on the final three. They were rotating the corners quite a bit early on. There were some injuries and then, you know, Jair, Jair Hill got an early start. He was obviously, probably the more heralded recruit. Um, but Waller, Waller feels like he's everything they wanted Amorian Walker to be. Yeah. 
yep, right? Tall, like, tall, the athletic. tall outside athletic corner. Yeah. So I think both of them are going to be good enough to play, but that's, it's weird because you're right. People, <laughs> people are really anxious about that CB2 spot last year. Even when Wallace got added, I yeah. saw people comparing him to Wayne Lyons, which I don't know if people <laughs> remember, you know, he got added and his mom was hired and they ended up not playing. And I'm like, that's crazy. He's not going to be that. <laughs> oh, he played at UMass. Well, blah, blah, blah. you know, I remember you, you probably remember me saying this. I had made comparisons to you. I thought it was kind of like getting Jamon green back. Mm-hmm. where he was a guy you knew you could start the year out with. And then if one of the younger guys took the, the job, like you said, man, he held on that job and he was right there in, in coverage with Will and Mike, super impressive. So that that's big shoe, big shoes to fill <laughs> for a yeah. guy that people didn't think was going to have a huge impact. But in a weird way, I, I feel more comfortable this year because I do think between Waller and Hill, either one or both could take a big leap. Absolutely. And the thing that excites me about Waller is, is like you mentioned, his length. If you, if you start two cornerbacks on the outside with Will Johnson and DJ Waller, those are two guys that are pushing six, three. Yeah. And, and I think that's very favorable for, for guys that play cornerback This tall, long wingspans helps you knock away the ball. So that I, I do think that's at least for me, what gives Waller the edge over Hill at this current moment. But like you mentioned, Jire Hill was, was the more heralded heralded recruit. Um, yeah. In a weird way, I feel like Hill might be the better CB one, but Waller might be the better compliment to play across from Will Johnson. Yeah. If that makes sense. Right. But yeah, no, it's, I, I think that that's the big spring position battle, how they utilize McBurrows and the other safeties in the nickel role, how the depth start to starts to develop in the front we know what we have from a starter level, but again, who, who rises up if you will, from that group, um, we didn't, we didn't touch on wide receiver or tight end. I, I think that's pretty well known at this point. You know, you've got Samaj Morgan and, and Tyler Morris over there. Fred Moore maybe takes a leap. There's questions there too. And and you have Colston level at tight end and that's all you need to know. <laughs> yeah, the best tight end. But um, let, let, let's wrap up this with put you on the spot here. Who do you think, who, who's going to be the story of this spring? Maybe maybe it's a Ben Hall, right? The guy that <laughs> that comes on and nobody expected, and now he's going to be an All-American, like you said. Or or it's just a starter taking another leap, or a guy carving out a two-deep spot, whatever it is. One offense, one defense. Who, who do you think is going to be the talk of spring? You know, I'll, for offense, I think – Samaj Morgan and Tyler Morris are kind of givens, like you mentioned. And Fred Moore got a little bit of playing time too. But before last season started, my pick for freshman breakout player of the year was Carmelo English. And I don't know what it is about him, but I like him. And he only had one touchdown, I think, and it was in garbage time against Indiana, if I remember right. But I think he's I think he's going to carve out a role and I do think Michigan is going to have to go to the portal for a wide out a taller a taller wide receiver because let's face it Samaj Morgan, Tyler Morris, Fred Moore and Carmelo English are all kind of kind of smaller guys. Even I the mean, guys coming in, I'm Irene Stewart, they're all very similar players, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I do think they're going to have to go to the portal but Carmelo English can carve out a role, I think at, at receiver um and then defense, defense. I'll go with Zeke Barry. Nice. I think he is a stud. He didn't play a whole lot last year, but he had he one. Play. Too, yeah, yeah. He had one play. I can't even remember what game it was. I think it was either later in the non-conference or earlier in Big Ten play against Rutgers. Maybe there was one play he just shot out of a cannon. I mean. It was unreal, and and he ended up with a tackle for loss. He, I didn't bring him up in in our in our talk about the secondary, but if he can if he can break out and, and really push McBurrows and and other guys, I don't know if if they see Barry as a true safety or a nickel or, or I to me. I don't want to. I don't want to make this this comparison because people might say this is like totally out of this world. But oh, he excited. almost seems 
like a Jabril Preppers kind of guy where he doesn't have a set position almost. He, he's he's nowhere near as talented as as Peppers was, but he he kind of just seems like a, a floating guy to me, if that makes any sense. I don't know. I don't know if you see it that way like I do, but. Yeah, no, they, him and Seb were both kind of seen as these hybrid guys in different ways. I thought Sab was probably closer to Peppers just from that physical standpoint. But no, I agree. It, I think he's going to be a guy that you can move around. And it'll be interesting yeah. to see how they move him around. He was actually, last year, before Wallace was added, I felt that Barry could show he could be good enough to be the nickel and then Sainer still potentially move outside because he's your second best corner. I thought yeah. that was one potential scenario because it didn't really feel like a CB2 was going to rise. So coming into spring, that arguably has potential to happen again. I think that's a great pick. Carmelo English is a great pick too. He got a slow start because he wasn't an early enrollee like more and Morgan was, but he's yeah. right there with them in terms of potential and I don't know, again, with them all being so similar, I've seen Fred Moore kind of being penciled into that X role. And then English maybe is a Z hybrid with Morris or he's the backup slot, or maybe they're just going to rotate them all like crazy. And there's just not going to be <laughs> positional assignments anymore. It, it, it'll be interesting. Um, it's tough. I just said Zeke Barry. So, and agreed with you on that. So may, maybe he's my pick on defense, but okay. I'm going to go with the guy I mentioned earlier, which is, Eno Etta. I, I think he is going to surprise people with how he looks physically when he shows up at spring. And we know if you're good enough, even if there's a starting defensive end, you're going to be right behind them in terms of reps. I don't think he's going to carve a big role into Derek Moore. But I think Moore is going to take a huge leap. But just from natural rotations, I think Etta has a chance to have a big role and that could start in spring where I think he's just going to be one of those guys that, again, if it's just a hype machine thing, he's just going to be physically impressive and people are going to get really excited about him on defense. Man, on offense, English is so good. I almost want to <laughs> I want to stick with that. But what I think is going to happen, I think Ben Hall is going to get right back on his hype train again. Yeah, I, I think Ben Hall is going to – everything that was being said about him last year is going to be said again about him this year, and he's going to have – a higher up role already on the depth chart coming in and it, you know, just a chance to get more exposure. So I, I think he's going to get a lot of talk as well. Um, some folks have chimed in here. Steve put Crippen on offense. Agree. I, I think he's already being presented as, as a face and a potential captain, arguably. And Pierce, yeah. we, we talked about him a little bit as well. And then some folks talk about QB portal shopping. Agree. It just, I think it depends on who goes in the portal. If, is Cam Rising back? Cam Rising is back at Utah. This he is. Year? I think he oh is. My God, that's crazy. I remember wanting to enter before he got hurt, but I'd imagine dude from Arizona is not coming in since he's stuck in after the whole fish deal. Um, I I literally was like scouring rosters and trying to find position <laughs> battles the other day because I'm like, who in the world? <laughs> could potentially jump into the portal that that's going to be a game changer but i think we'll we'll be able to learn early on from the chatter how they feel about the qb room and then obviously at the spring game what they do in terms of if there's clear starters on each side if they rotate them a bunch and then i think it was your average fan said we'll all get to overreact to the one or two throws <laughs> that each yeah. of them make and and pick our side as yep. we move forward with the starter battle but yeah very, very, very big week we're heading into for Michigan sports. Like I said, football spring camp kicking off. Michigan basketball, the coaching search is obviously going to start to pick up steam. Some more smoke will come from that. And then Michigan hockey preparing. Did we even get to hockey? No, we haven't. We haven't talked about hockey yet. Oh, it's an hour and a half. <laughs> all right. That's a bummer. Hmm. That's all right. Everyone should just know. Michigan plays Michigan State in the Big Ten Championship on Saturday. Yeah, here you go. Yep. Michigan, Michigan's gonna make the NCAA tournament. <laughs> and it was it was close there for a minute, but but they've they've really picked it up as of late. What I found interesting was that Michigan beat Minnesota for the third straight year yep. at Minnesota. 
And I couldn't help but think about comparisons of like the Kansas City Chiefs and Buffalo Bills, where the Chiefs just always beat the Bills in the playoffs. It's almost seemed like Michigan has kind of you just have that as a number at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I don't think anyone was really expecting Michigan to win because Minnesota, Minnesota at home, really talented team, higher in the pairwise than Michigan is, but mm-hmm. the Wolverines just have some some March magic, it seems, and, and they're going to go into East Lansing next week and try and knock off the number one seed Spartans. It's going to be it's going to be a feisty game. I can guarantee you that. Oh, for sure. I mean, this is you know Michigan State's first appearance, going for their first. They won the first big their first Big Ten regular season championship, going for their first Big Ten tournament championship. Michigan going for their third straight. Um, the story for me all year, frustratingly, has been Trey Augustine. Uh, I, I, he has been phenomenal. I can't wait for him to get to Detroit and out of East Lansing. Um, obviously a former Michigan commit. I, I just wonder, I mean, the role reversals, if he had stayed at Michigan, I, I I've been picking on Michigan's netminder all year, but I, I just think that would have been a monster difference for them. <laughs> um, and he, he's going to be a big story, obviously in this game going against Michigan. Like I said, they are, they're in the tournament now at this point. They swept, I've got on the bottom there, they swept Notre Dame, they split the series with Minnesota, and then swept Notre Dame again in that first round, and that that kind of sealed them. The win against Minnesota is huge. Beating Michigan State would also be huge, but it sounds like, you know, I'm not an expert on this, but just looking at expert, it sounds like they're locked into that number 10 spot. But what will be interesting is the Big Ten's going to have four teams this year because yep. you're going to have Michigan, you're going to have Minnesota, you're going to have Michigan State, and you're also going to have Wisconsin. And they usually go out of their way to make sure there's not any conference rematches in the regionals. So you think those four are going to get split up, which yep. is really fun to think about because obviously you got Boston and Boston College at the top there. But we could have a lot of Big Ten teams in the Frozen Four this year. So yep, um, there were two four- last year, and Mich- Michigan and Minnesota were both in last year. Uh, I don't think they got a third in, if I remember right. Michigan lost to. Quinnipiac, Minnesota, Minnesota played Minnesota State or something like that. Mm-hmm. Some some odd team, but could you That's imagine? I love about hockey. There's always just some random tiny. I know. I love it. I know. I love you it get so much. like like Maine. Maine, I think, is projected mm-hmm. to be in the in, in the NCAA tournament. It's like what? But yeah, actually, that's, that's I think college hockey for you, yeah, Maine. You got like Maine Colorado College. Yeah, Denver's obviously a powerhouse, North Dakota. And then you've got like, yeah, Colorado College looking on in. Western yeah. Michigan is probably a lock to get in. So, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see if they, if they get a favorable path. I mean, they're obviously clicking at the right time. It, it's a good, a really good team. You, yep. You've got goal scorers. Gavin Brindley's obviously a monster. Rutgers a monster. Um, Duke's been coming on. Sheamus is just one of the best. I don't know from assist standpoints and just feeding the puck. He's been unreal the yep. last couple of months. So they're clicking at the right time. People are starting to get a little uncomfortable with, with Brandon. So, <laughs> hey man, I, you know, if you, if you can break Michigan state's heart and in, in the big 10 championship and carve out another frozen four run, man, whoo. Yep. And recruiting has been good. They, they're, they're still Absolutely. building. They, they got some more guys coming in. I have not, gotten off of the Brandon train yet myself, but no. And, and if, if he takes them to a third straight, I think it'd be third straight frozen four. I know at least three, then I don't know how you can be upset with that as a Michigan fan. If you're in the frozen four every year, pff, you're, right. I mean, you're bound to win it once every couple of seasons at the very least. So <laughs> you'd think so. Yeah. That's a lot true. of, a lot of bridesmaid years <laughs> for Michigan <laughs> hockey. Uh, uh, I got to watch it more in the, and get into it more in the regular season because it used to be my favorite sport when I was a kid because it was like the one sport I continued to play as I got older. I had goalie pads, so I was a goalie because like no other kid had goalie pads. That's basically how it worked out back then because it was all club sports. There just wasn't money. But college, pro, it, it doesn't matter, man. Playoff hockey, elimination hockey, there's nothing better, man. Yep. It's so, so good. So, yeah, Brock will be all over it. I will be pretending to know what I'm talking about, we'll cover Michigan hockey throughout the week leading up to the game on Saturday against Michigan State. Josh, again, will continue to provide his intel and information on the basketball coaching search. And, and hopefully, I mean, a lot of the coach speak rumblings that, that come out of 
camper. Oh my God. All right. <laughs> Steve, I don't remember if you were here for the circuit city conversation, Brock, were you? I, I don't think I was. Yeah. That I worked at circuit city. And yeah. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, <laughs> buying the goalie pads. I think my uncle got them for me for like Christmas or something. I don't remember, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that's, that is hilarious. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, we'll start to get some smoke from practice. Um, they're not going to be in pads right away, obviously, but mm -hmm. maybe some position changes, obviously, like Brock said, we're going to be ready to overreact to the weights as those start to come in, but yep. all that, all the conversation happening at michigan.rivals.com. If you haven't joined already, again, we are running our 50% off your entire year promo right now. Repeat 2024, go to michigan.rivals.com. Use that promo. You get half off your entire year. That gets you access to premium content, gets you access to the Dan message board community. And obviously Josh's Intel will be posted there. Otherwise, if you're watching us live, thank you for the conversation. Thank you for contributing as always. If you want to join us live on YouTube, make sure you're liking, subscribing, getting the notification bell for the Amazing Blue Review YouTube channel so you know when we go live. Otherwise, hopefully Josh will join us again next week. Otherwise, Brock, locked in the closet, but very good job, man. I enjoyed, <laughs> I enjoyed having just the two of us. Maybe I'll, I'll tell Josh to stay away, but I did miss his... <laughs> we just didn't have that good uncomfortable moment, like talking about John Wooden's corpse. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or his taco shits or <laughs> no, we, we miss you, Josh. He'll be back next week. We hope you are too. Hail to the podcast. We'll be here Sunday live at eight o'clock. Thank you for joining us and we will see you again soon.